to kind of start dreaming like, oh, would this be possible for me? This three hours, and um, but I never really said to myself like, okay, this is my goal. But I just started training, and I thought like, well, let's see how I progress, and then we can set goals um, in in the future. And I, I think it was not necessarily maybe even the time because that's just the number, but. To feel about how how I accomplished it in the way that it was just um, so relaxed until like 37, 30k, when and then you should start <laughs> to feel your legs and it should start to hurt because otherwise I guess you're not running fast enough. That the energy was still there even after finishing. Okay, the legs were done, but the energy level was still there. Like you know, the, the brains were still working. <laughs> And I think that was actually the thing that even surprised, like the time surprised me maybe, but um, the way I've done it, that made me the most happiest, I think. Welcome to another episode of the Extra Miles Show. This is already episode number 49. My name is Floris German, and on this podcast, I interview different guests about ways to become a stronger healthier and happier athlete. In today's episode, I'm interviewing Danny Huibrechtsen. I don't know how to pronounce that properly in English, but he's a fellow Dutchman and that's how we would say it in Dutch, Danny Huibrechtsen. Anyways, Danny improved from a 3.59 marathon time all the way down to a 2.34. And in his last marathon, he actually ran a 34 minute PB from a 3.08 all the way down to that 2.34. In this conversation, I want to bring him on the podcast and really talk through how did he improve so much over time? What were his learnings from his training and his racing? And what were some of the recommendations to other athletes looking to improve? Danny and I first connected in the summer of 2019 when he enrolled in our personal best running coaching program. And this has been very fascinating to see his progress in training and racing. And really, my mind is just blown away by how much he has progressed when he wanted to run under sub three and actually was able to smash it all the way down to a 234. Our PB program is a running coaching program and we often focus on low heart rate training, race day strategy and so much more. If you'd like to find out more, check out pbprogram.com. That is the letter P b program.com without further ado i hope you enjoy my conversation with danny huibrechtse Let, let's change let's transfer from dutch to english and actually start start recording danny welcome to the extra mile show very happy to have you here thank you very much flores yeah it's an honor to be here yeah it's been it, it's been absolutely fascinating to see your running journey and then especially the last transition that you have made the last last big progress i would say in the 12 18 months leading up to your recent race performance um you improved significantly you want to run a sub three hour marathon and you ended up running not just a sub three but a 234 (laughs) so (laughs) i'm really excited to actually like go through your training journey to dive into your actual race day experience but maybe we can start out with what was your first running experience like when did you start running what was your first marathon like kind of guide us through that initially my sports career started with uh, playing football like well okay in europe football is uh, like soccer in in the states so that was the first experience with sports and um yeah, along with the soccer, you automatically uh, also get in touch with the running. Like sometimes when uh, the soccer field was not good enough for practice, you went out for a run uh, with the teammates. Um, also during the summer breaks, you to keep up your uh, your level of fitness, uh, you would go for a few runs. So that was really the first experience I had. Plus. Um, my dad, he was uh, quite into running as well and also in playing football. Uh, so together we were either playing football or going for a run. Um, so that basically progressed very slowly from like age five when you just play soccer to um, 
I guess around the age of about 10 years old, where you start going for some small runs together and uh, some local competitions here in the area. And um, yeah, but it was always uh, together with, with the soccer. So it was never a structured uh, training program or yeah, like structure was just non existence. <laughs> and whenever you went out for a run, it had to go as fast as possible, as far <laughs> as possible. Uh, oh, so yeah. there was no philosophy behind it. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. The last several podcast guests who have been in Europe, like when it was Ash, when it was Ben Idusai, and now it's you, all from a soccer background. And then even last time, Sally McRae, that was more US-based, but he came from a soccer background as well. And it's indeed a different type of approach to running, but there's still been plenty of running involved over there. So. Yeah, plus also like soccer here in Europe, it's like American football in the States. It's it's so big, so it's almost no questions asked for when people go to do their first sports, it's pretty much soccer because that's almost in every village uh, there's a team. So yeah. it's easy to uh, to get a membership over there and start playing. And then when did you start becoming serious about running and when did you sign up for your first marathon? Uh, yeah, so I signed up uh, for the first one. This was um, in 2008. I ran the first one. Uh, so that was at the age of 18. Um, and um, this was actually after my dad ran the first or the same marathon a year before. And um, I wanted to do the same thing. Only the problem was that you had to be 18 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to wait for another year. So actually he ran it in 2006. Which one? Which one was it? It's a local marathon which passes um, the village here. So it's uh, in the area, of the province of Zeeland. It runs along the coastline. So it's quite a, a heavy one with uh, some dunes and uh, a lot of beaches. <laughs> so it, it's definitely not a fast one. Uh, there's always wind, of course. Um, <clears throat> most of the time, it's a headwind. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> And if the tie is wrong, then you have to, to run on the soft beach only. So it's uh, yeah, it's pretty tough, or it could be really tough. Uh, sometimes it's much better. Um, but yeah, it all depends on the elements, pretty much. Mm. And what was that experience like for you? Uh, yeah, the first one, it's uh, was, of course, absolutely no pressure. It was just like, okay, I'm going to try this. Um, I should be able to finish it. And, and that's it. Like, no... I mean, I had a watch on, but there was no weird, no really timing or anything. So it was just finishing the race and that's it. Right on. Good. So I it's just... actually quite coincidental <laughs> that it was just below this four hour mark. <laughs> that was like, oh yeah, that was surprising me, but that, that was it. Yeah. So what was the time? It was 3.59 for that one? Yeah, three fifty nine, fifty seven. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's good. So that was your first marathon, two thousand eight, and then how did the progression go from there? What What was after that? Well, there was pretty much no progressions from there. Um, I mean, I was eighteen years old and um, started doing. Uh, the education which no time left for training really and um also this 2008 one there was pretty much no structure in it um in the training block so it was just okay and i had i knew i had to do this long run so i was just going out and trying to make it to 30 kilometers and that was it uh there was like no specific spacing or i did some interval sessions but it was all just uh by by feel pretty much mm -hmm. and that that's it and then so when i was uh studying then there was pretty much no time for training either so i was so now and then just out for a run but you're talking about maybe one you know in a good week two runs a week uh but then it could also be that for two or three weeks i did not do anything so there was really little or no progression because in like 2011 i did the same marathon again although it was very hot this year mm -hmm. so obviously it was 
pretty tough as well, but that was uh, six minutes slower than the first one. So there was <laughs> really no progression there. So at, at that time, you were a full-time student as well. Um, uh, yeah, so for two years only actually, but yeah. Was that like the average Dutch student life of a lot of partying and drinking or was it pretty strict? <laughs> <laughs> like, like just kind of trying to get an understanding of what your life was like those days? Uh, no, so I did the uh, pilot training, which basically consists of eight months uh, studying a lot. So just studying the books and afterwards it's uh, only the practical side of it. So you're flying on small air aircrafts, uh, which for me meant that first I was half a year in Portugal. And later on, I moved for half a year to Phoenix, actually in the States. Oh, wow. So, nice. and uh, as I wasn't 21 yet, uh, obviously, there was not a lot of drinking involved in the States. <laughs> yeah. but, so, uh, no, it was much busier than the average student uh, in the Netherlands um, or anywhere else. Uh, so, yeah, of course, we had so now and then a party, but it was nothing outrageous or anything. Okay. Right on. And then fast forward to the next marathon, because I know there was like a progression and then all of a sudden there was this massive leap forward. So wh wh what about the third marathon? Where do, where do we end up at that point? Yeah, so this was 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, same marathon again, the local one. So courses wise, it's all been in the same. Um, I trained bit better i have to say uh so made some more mileage um and with the goal of breaking 330 so still there was no real structure no real um thinking behind the trainings that i'd done but at least there were some more trainings and it was planned a little bit better mm -hmm. uh not like with the other times that you it's like oh shit we just have two months to go let's start trading now <laughs> uh, so this was a bit more structured but nothing compared to what it should have been for running a decent marathon i would say um and then obviously i missed the goal as well as i finished in 338 so missed it with eight minutes and i think this was for my feeling the worst marathon i've ever done like Bonking really bad that uh, already at I think twenty somewhere between twenty five and thirty k in uh, this was a disaster. Uh, really thinking about just quitting the race as well because like five minutes uh, sorry five k before the finish or like seven k before the finish we're passing the village that I live in so it's so easy just to take a left turn and go home. Uh, luckily I didn't do this but. Um, yeah, so finished three thirty eight, but yeah, feeling really disappointed in it. What what year was that? The three thirty eight. This was in uh, two thousand eighteen, so October two thousand eighteen. Okay, and so your training volume, you said, was uh, it increased a bit? Was it still relative low? It was really low, especially for running a marathon. I I think I yeah, I just looked it up as well. It was like around uh, thirty five kilometers a week <laughs> <laughs> which mainly was then uh interval trainings i guess and i might have done like two or three long runs towards the 30 kilometers that's that's about it yeah and then then how did it go after that 338 bonked in the marathon what were the next steps from there and i met you flores <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad I'm past cross there. <laughs> yeah, no, it was uh, so. As I said, I was really disappointed, and you're looking for a reason why it didn't work out as as you were planning on. So I started researching a little bit uh, on the internet, and then from one thing came another, and then eventually bumped into the YouTube movies from you, and. Well, the, the one thing which really struck me was that I don't know exactly what movie it was, but you were uh, telling about like, uh, are you also this guy who uh, cannot 
go for a run before breakfast and then has to digest the breakfast before running and every training is going full blast and you were going on and on and on. I was like, oh yeah, that's me. Oh, that's me as well. And so it was going on. I was like, oh yeah, I think I should pay attention to this movie and enter the solution. So I, I, I was looking for all the, the movies and then eventually, as you were saying about or telling about this math, methadone training, um, gotten into that so I, I really walked the whole pretty much the whole line that you were walking as well with uh, methadone and then later on with the uh, chi running as well which I found very useful for myself um, I think that was were definitely the two big changers for me uh, the methadone method and then in combination with the chi running uh, where the training completely changed from uh, very hard every every day to actually very slow every day. <laughs> it was a complete different approach for what you had previously done. What were those initial stages like for you in your training? What was it like to all of a sudden have to slow down? Um, actually, it was for me, it wasn't too bad. Um, I knew why I was doing it. And I think that was the the most important thing that you you know why you're slowing down plus as i was doing my runs pretty much all over the world because of the job no it wasn't really an issue of uh having friends and family seeing me run now 10 times slower as i used to so i could kind of hide away uh <laughs> from the people i knew which maybe is then a bit bit easier i don't know mm -hmm. um but yeah it all kind of um, made sense then to slow down and then um, I was enjoying the runs more so therefore I could go more often but also with um, it was easy uh, to actually protect yourself huh? when you're fatigued in any way like sleep deprivation or just fatigued from running the days before you could just protect yourself by keeping a slow pace yeah what what were some of the things that you ended up noticing in those first few weeks first few months um with math training i i think i was quite lucky in the way that i saw the improvement pretty quick um so it probably took only like two maybe three weeks where i could see some improvements although minor uh, it was like and maybe it was just that i was having less sleep deprivation or was fitter at that point but at least i saw um, the average pace of the training was already uh, faster than than when i was starting so that was immediately a good sign and it actually kick-started the whole thing because then you see like okay yeah, i'm only like two or three weeks in this and it's already paying off now so uh you get really confident in uh, in this training method yeah yeah it is it, it is like for some people indeed they start noticing faster progress or like progress rather quickly like what you're experiencing there like in just a few weeks you start noticing slight progress and that gives you like all right something is going on over here whereas there's other people too who might need some more time or they might need some more training volume or yeah it just takes a little bit longer indeed so that that was nice that you were in that category that you start noticing yeah yeah i think that really helps of course when you straight away make notice the changes but um yeah anyway it's either short or it takes you longer anyway it, it will work out when you when you stick with it yeah well but the funny thing is right before you and i jumped on this in this call i was going through some of our earlier emails and some of our earlier messages because in when was it in july 2019 you signed up for our running coaching program and Initially, like that was like, yeah, that was nice progress. But then I also saw somewhere in mid-August, we started exchanging some messages about the topic of like, hey, I feel like I'm going backwards. Hey, I think like, and, but there were also some other factors involved, whether that was nutrition, you working, 
night shifts or like sometimes like overnight um, as a pilot and different climates and whatnot. Can you talk about some of those challenges that you experienced and kind of how you overcame some of that? Yeah, I, th- I think it's really diverse, of course, with, uh, with the challenges uh, I had there. Uh, so for bigger picture, I'm working as an airline pilot. So I'm working night and day all around the world. So you have the jet lags, but like sometimes your body is so upside down that you don't even know <laughs> where you are or what time zone you are. Uh, so uh, fatigue plays a big role in that and also uh, mitigating fatigue and trying to get your sleep. Um, so as I'm dealing with so many variables, it's also, or at least that's what I found out and later on after this conversation, email conversation we had about me not progressing that, uh, that fast or not at all, actually, I was thinking like, yeah, maybe just this uh, math tests are not really working for me because, um, you know, I have so many variables. When can I do a math test which is in the same environment and me in the same fitness as I've done the last time? So comparing those two is really difficult. I mean, I can I cannot say like, oh, I go every Monday or at first Monday of the month I do this because I might be working, but I might also be home, but just returning from a long trip where it, for my body, it feels like doing a run in the night. So I just, after this conversation we had via the email, I just decided, well, I saw then eventually the progress coming back again. So getting confident again in the, in the training method. And then I just decided, well, that's probably not going to work for me, this, this math test. So after, I think, August or September 2019, I haven't done any real math tests anymore, but I just, monitor my training in a way that especially on the recovery runs i do i nowadays i just stick to like 140 sometimes a bit higher but definitely below 150 beats a minute and i can still see then the progress in the pace i have so it's not very linear anymore but yeah if you see what i'm doing now on recovery runs on the same uh, average heart rate as i've done half a year ago there's still an improvement and that's where i'm looking at now just the improvements for compared to a few months ago because it will go up and down uh on a weekly basis on a monthly basis and even yearly basis there are always these peaks and and lows yeah well and i think you make such a valid point that there, there are indeed so many of these different variables in the mix for you like whether you're running in Dubai and like it's hot and humid or like there you are in Seattle or that like you're all over the place. And indeed, the the sleep component alone plays such a massive role in that too. And indeed, if you have only slept X amount of hours or or like day of the time of the day that you're running, all of that can can definitely make a difference. So, yeah, yeah, sure. What, what about the nutritional component? Did you change anything in that area? Yeah, as well. Uh, just along with the advices I gotten from YouTube movies, plus the the book, the yellow book of uh, the big yellow book, yes. So I, I, in the beginning, I uh, when I started off with it, I took it quite serious. So um, I think the first like one to two months, I was uh, quite onto it, and then it's just. I backed off a little bit. Um, it was working, uh, definitely, actually. Uh, it was working very good, but it was also like, okay, I'm, I just like to have some sweets as well some now and then. Um, so, yeah, it's this balance where you have to look for, for um, some enjoyment in life and um, some enjoyment in training, I would say. So it's... Uh, I think it's an important element, although um, for some people, they have to, or they might have to stick with it very strictly. Some people, not so much, uh, and anywhere in between. And I find when I'm enjoying life, <laughs> so having some sweets so now and then, uh, still 
brings me some uh, progress. So as long as I'm progressing, I'm quite happy with that. Yeah, it it is such a fine line indeed because you can go way overboard with it. Uh, you can find fi- like you can also f- follow some of the basic fundamentals and and still live life indeed. And I think there's that there's ways to combine it absolutely. So I think at at least the most important thing is that as as long as you know what it does to you. So when you eat sugars or carbs, that you know what it does to your body, and um, also now. I I notice it when I have had sugars or carbs that you can feel like oh yeah I'm feeling a bit sluggish it's like oh yeah wait I just had a big cake or whatever uh, so it's probably that and then also if I have then a recovery run planned I say like okay I'll wait like one or maybe two hours extra after having this cake because otherwise I feel shitty on the run yeah so I think that's that's the main thing that you at least know what you do to your body when you're eating it and therefore automatically you cut down on it so compared to like three years ago i'm eating much less carbs and sugar so it's already a big improvement but uh cutting them out completely is just not uh, not an option yet for me <laughs> maybe in the future who knows but. Yeah, but then again like i think it's just very eye-opening and you make a valid very valid point there that we just start to become more in tune with our bodies and how we respond to like not just different workout intensities, but also what we put in our body. And some of it like our bodies might respond well to and some of it might, whether it's upset stomach or feeling sluggish or our energy levels are down or spiking or yeah, that's it's good to be more aware of where. I guess it also comes with age like at some point you just start to know your body better and as well if you experiment with things here and there that you actually feel your body changing or feel your mood changing uh like that three or even more like let's say five years ago um i didn't even know like having so many slices of bread would maybe in a way harmful for you and that there were better options maybe uh so it's also a bit of education of course and um yeah i mean we keep learning so that comes with age as well i think it's also because we grew up in holland both you and i and that's just such staple standard <laughs> breakfast and lunch is just a sandwich with peanut butter, uh, peanut butter or or cheese or whatever it might be but yeah yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's funny. All right, then on February 19, 2020, I get an email from you saying, or a message from you, I'm going to break my sub three hour goal. That's my next step. Tell me, how did it go from 338 to your next race right there? This was in October 2018. That was the disappointing race of the 338. Mm-hmm. Uh, then there was some time off from running pretty much um, then I picked it up uh, with the research I've done in February 2019 and that was actually and because a lot of your movies were about this sub three hour goal so um, automatically you start thinking about this as well plus uh, the extra thing for me was that uh, my dad's personal best is like three hours and I think 59 seconds or so. <laughs> so he, he was just shy of the three hours. So that's, of course, an extra motivator for me. To of beat course. Your dad. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So then with watching the movies, you kind of start dreaming like, oh, would this be possible for me? This three hours. And, um, but I never really said to myself like okay this is my goal but i just started training and i thought like well let's see how i progress and then we can set goals um in in the future and as i see all myself progressing rather quickly i was like okay well maybe this is possible so i i think i gave myself then uh two years so i thought like okay i'll do 2019 and 2020 I'll keep training and I thought like if I can just shave off every year like 15 minutes then I'm getting close to the three hours or I would have come to three hours and eight minutes 
And uh, as I was running the Nostril, always the marath- the local marathon here, which was not quick, I thought that I can enlist for a fast marathon and try to break the three hours. And so I started training in February 2019 with the Mephton method. So uh, we were progressing then quite nicely. And I think I took like a solid four or five months just uh, low heart rate training mm-hmm. and just to build the base and uh, I was coming then from like maybe 35 a week uh, 40 kilometers a week before the marathon and now I was doing without actually having a real goal like a marathon um, I was training like 50 to 60 kilometers a week already um and it was just it kept increasing because like oh yeah first it was like twice a week three times a week and i was like oh no but i enjoy it so uh let's see if i can squeeze in one more and so it just kept on growing and the length per training kept growing and yeah before you know it you're uh you're training like 90 kilometers a week good and and you were still able to handle the training volume were you doing any when did you start integrating some speed work from there you said four or five months base building yeah so um let's see this was the race i think end of june uh or beginning of july 2019 so i decided to uh, register for a 10k race uh, which i ran before as well and i thought i'll just do this uh, low heart rate training and see whether it really works then for the speed as well. Um, so I did this race, which was then already, um, I think my personal best before that on 10K was 38.45, something like that. Here I ran uh, without any speed work, uh, 37 low, I think. And while finishing as well, like fitter than ever. And I actually... I think I actually decided to run home <laughs> into <laughs> another 5K. So that's just like a good uh, cool down, I, I was running home as well, which before would have never been possible. Yeah. So yeah, the le- that, level of fitness was much higher uh, back then. And as well, the next day I I could go for a run already, which before was also was definitely not possible. Yeah, and that's fascinating. That's without any speed work. And then after that, you started at some point integrating some speed work back into your training again too, right? Yeah, correct. Because so with this race, I had my proof that I was working and that I was progressing and as well that I recovered quickly from, in this occasion, a race. But I said, well, then I will recover quickly from interval training as well. So I went back to the track then, uh, started just with one speed workout a week. So um, that's where, where I started to, to train again uh, with the group and progressed then nicely as well. And then I think it, the progression was even quicker than, than before. Uh, so uh, yeah, the, the base was obviously very solid and uh, with just adding some speed work then it just kicked off and then then the next marathon how was that experience like for you after going through a solid base building period and some speed work integration uh yeah that was uh that was a different world <laughs> really <laughs> yeah so um i've done a half marathon then as well a few weeks before uh, which is partially on the same course and uh, that one was going very good as well with some uh, energy left in the tank uh, when finishing and so then the marathon itself uh, I started off a bit cautiously um, where I was because I thought like well you know I'm coming from 338 so 315 would be really good time already and um yeah you know thought like uh, maybe 310 if it's going really good but uh i wasn't 
really expecting it to break the three three ten or three fifteen even. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, as the race was progressing, it was like I was running first ten k, and I was like, okay, yeah, you know, pace yourself, so not going too fast, but it, it felt even more easy than the first. 10ks uh, the year before or any 10k I've done before <laughs> uh, so I, as it was progressing I, I was kind of cautious with uh, speeding up as I always uh, had a pretty tough time around this 30 to 35k point so I wanted to wait but then at some point it was like at 25ks in I guess I was like okay I'm, I'm still uh i'm still here being able to talk to everyone and i i guess i was still breathing through my nose as well so i i really did not start it to having a workout <laughs> yet so then i finally picked up the pace as well and then um uh finishing with 308 uh that was of course much better than expected but as well i i had a feeling that there was much more to be uh, to reach as well because yeah uh, again of course your legs are tired after a marathon no matter what pace you're running but uh yeah i really had a feeling i could have done better on that one um well, without I, too much effort <laughs> oh, and it was a 30 minutes personal best right there so if you shave off that much time in a race you would think like all right there's probably more opportunity here if indeed I go at it again through another training cycle and with more race experience. So, yeah. And I think that that might have even be, have been the limiting factor for me that, you know, you're coming from this 338. So you think like, whoa, at 30 minutes to shave off in one year, that, that's a lot. But actually, I guess it could have been even more. <laughs> well, and then... Once you had 308, you're starting to get so close to your dad's goal and to your to the sub three as well. So that brings us to the last tra- training cycle or like the last marathon that you just ran. What was the difference once again between what you were doing there and how you were able to run a 334, oh, sorry, a two, 234 Um at this race just recently over here what what were like the main differences in in training and racing approach here i think the biggest changes i didn't change too much actually um it was just that i was kept becoming faster and faster so with all the runs i i did so recovery runs long runs uh interval sessions and at some stage there was also a fartlek session integrated in the training program yeah and what what was what was your training volume at that point like how how high were you getting your training volume because i know you were still and you were traveling for work quite a bit you had your first child was born so there were some some, some other factors in the mix again too uh, after this uh, 308 uh, so this was in october uh, then i decided like okay uh, we can do this shot that three hour limit a year earlier than expected so i enlisted for the rotterdam marathon which is uh, traditionally run in april so it would have been april 2020 uh of course <laughs> we all know what then happened <laughs> <laughs> so that one was cancelled but i was lucky with uh, as preparation for the marathon uh, i enlisted for half marathon as well which was run like a month before and that was like the last big running event which uh went through before corona happened uh there i ran uh 117 wow. and a half <laughs> so that was already like okay we're well within the three hours range here and um in that training block actually leading towards the marathon because it was cancelled on i guess it was like three weeks before or yeah, something like that. So it was very close to it. So you're fully prepared already. So I had my training block and there I was, I think I was hitting around uh, 120K a week. So that was actually a bit more volume than um, just before the marathon I just ran in, in October. 
but I had a bit more time and um, as well, there was no Corona yet. So work-wise, it was easier as well, where now I'm faced with sometimes being locked up in a hotel room, not being allowed to leave it. So there's no possible workout or at least no, no running workout possible uh, in those uh, those destinations. Um, so yeah, but the biggest change was I guess that Fartlek was introduced in as well. So at least one let's call it interval session a week extra. And um, yeah, the, the volume, weekly volume kept growing as well. Uh, plus the long run, we did a bit faster as well. So uh, on the long run, normally around just after halfway point, I was speeding up a little bit. And then, so uh, for me, the, my heart rate, I usually keep below 150 and then I would let it go towards like 55, 160. Um, so there was a bit more speed into it as well, yeah. Yeah. Right on. What about race day strategy? So the marathon you were going to race was eventually the Rotterdam marathon in October, 2021. You did your training block. Talk to me about your taper and then getting ready for race day. Before the Rotterdam marathon in uh, last October, then, uh, yeah, so I was hitting around the hundred K to, I think my biggest week was 110. Um, but then as the volume was not as high as I would have liked, I had a bit more uh, speed sessions in there as well. So, and then from, I think, three weeks before, or nah, more like two weeks before, I think three weeks before I did uh, still a long run for like 33 or 34 with like a faster finish. So that was a bit, close to the marathon i think i just had to do this for my own uh confidence in in the the pace i wanted to run because back then i was still you know like aiming 245 maybe on a good day 240 um so yeah then i, I just wanted to feel the pace for a bit longer than just 30 kilometers so i wanted to uh, get a long run in and then i think i did from 30k or 31k i did a few uh, accelerations for just like 30 seconds but on a uh, much faster pace than marathon pace see if i could still bring that up and from that point on actually then i started to taper so i yeah I'm pretty sure this was in three weeks before uh, the marathon and yeah then i was just uh, bringing volume down, but still uh, going pretty fast on the intervals and fart legs. So the the long run was going down, and then as well I did. Usually I do my recovery runs for like an hour or so, um, but then I would, was just doing recovery runs for like forty five minutes or fifty minutes, just how it felt that day. So it, it kept slowly decreasing in the uh, the weekly mileage. But uh, the intensity was still there. What was your goal and plan kind of to go after on the race day itself? What were you, what were you aiming for? <laughs> yeah, well, that was, that's actually been a big question every race I listed for the last two years because every time, you know, you, you register for a race and you go training and then uh, you progress faster than expected uh so actually by the time you start to race it's like the goal is not really realistic anymore or it's like it's too low the goal um as i started for sub three uh this was like yeah i cannot go out here to try and run a sub three now uh, anymore this is a bit uh too low so i thought the beginning of the year so beginning of 2021, I said, like, okay, let's try it on 2.45. Um, and this at some stage in training, you could already notice as well that yeah, 2.45 should definitely be possible. And um, I said, okay, let's also look up the, the splits. I need to run for 2.40 then just to have them. And eventually I said like, okay, then 
238 would be nice as well. And I progressed for in two years of exactly one hour. Uh, so I looked those up as well. And so then I had the splits I had to run for per K and uh, for five Ks. And I just started off uh, the race. Um, I thought uh, I'll just go and run the somewhere between 240, 245 pace and, and see if I can find a group or some people who are trying to run the same pace and just stick with them as the first 10 Ks were, it was like, weather was beautiful, but the little bit of wind there was, there was a headwind for the first 10 K. So I thought at least stick with them for the 10 K. Um, and in Rotterdam, you start on the two different lanes. So it's, um, after about three or four K you let's, let's take a look. Let me, let me do a little screen uh, share, share here. <laughs> All right, so you start here in Rotterdam. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So this is a mile, so yeah. Yeah, it, it probably screws you a little bit because <laughs> my, <laughs> no, my, my setting is miles here. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so I guess in the first two miles, I was uh, running by myself, just finding the pace. And then uh, as the two lanes were put together around, three or four K. So I guess that's uh, two or three miles in the race. Mm -hmm. Then there was a, a quite a big group just running ahead of me, which I thought like, okay, they're running a bit faster than I would normally go for, but at least it's a nice big group. So it might be worth going for that, which I've done then. So I, I, I speeded up a little bit and got into the group. And this uh, turned out to be a perfect group for me to be running. Yeah, the uh, heart rate is uh, this is just on the watch, so that's uh, ah, okay, not okay. very accurate. Right on. And, uh, and so yeah, I got in the, in the group, and this was with pacers as well, as this was the first uh, Dutch female in the race, and there were some other uh, like professional female athletes in the group who used the pacers, and then a lot of guys got into the group as well, of course. So we, I think we had about 25 people in the group, which mm. was apparently the first big group to, to run the race. Nice. So when you look at your splits, you ended up running them very consistent here. Like the, this first part, it was all like, oh yeah, your, your time segment. So you're running three... 35 minute per kilometer, 340 minute per kilometer. So around 550 minute mile ish. Some a little bit faster, some a little bit slower. And then at what point did you think like, ah, this is actually doable to maintain this because you even started picking up your pace at some point a bit further. Yeah, so uh, we started I sticked with the group for quite a long time until I think it was about 27 K. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 26, 27. And then um, I was actually picking up a bottle of water uh, with the Morton gel in it as well. Uh, so I, I went in front of the group a little bit to pick up the bottle. And um, as I was drinking from the bottle, I noticed that the group was not coming back to me. Uh, so without actually pushing for it, I accelerated. And, and so then I was like, well, this feels right for me. Just stick with it. And I mean, we have 15 K to go. Like how bad can it be? <laughs> 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 so I, I just stick with the pace and then, uh, I kind of just waited for the legs to start really hurting, uh, which actually only happened about 37 38 where i first noticed some um yeah so i see 37 is quite a fast kilometer there 324 um, k uh, <laughs> so 528 minute mile at 37 k yeah uh, so i think about 38 k's in the race that uh, then i i it was not really hurting but i just felt the legs that uh, with one wrong step now and I completely cramp up <laughs> so I was getting a bit cautious but 
uh, that was the nice thing. Uh, I thought like, oh shit, now I have to slow down, um, see what will happen. But actually looking at my pace, it wasn't too bad at all. Like slowest K then was 3.47. Yeah, so six, six or five minute mile is still fast. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that that as well gave me some confidence as well when I thought like, oh, I, I'm slowing down. I thought I was slowing down, but actually it wasn't too bad at all. So yeah, there was... This group was was perfect. As first, I thought it's a bit too fast, but apparently, yeah, I was fit enough to to follow them. So, um, yeah, that 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 was the the big game changer in the in the race itself. As I was, <laughs> I only checked the splits at three thirty eight. Uh, sorry, to finish at two thirty eight. So I had no idea where I'm aiming. I was aiming at. I just I could only see that we were running faster than 238 and <laughs> so i still remember around i think it was like 24k or so i was running and at the head of the group as well just alongside the pacers there was hardly no wind anyway so it was no big deal uh so i was asking like where are you guys aiming for actually where he looked at me like don't you know <laughs> uh, no it's a bit faster than i anticipated so uh, so he said, like, yeah, we were aiming for 236, but we're actually a bit ahead of schedule already, like 30 seconds or something, which, of course, made sense. Like, they, they have marathon point, I think it was 117.20 or so. Um, but that was, of course, on the watch was a bit earlier than in the real race. So, but yeah, I knew we were about this 236, 235. Um, time zone where then initially was like oh shit that's like different ball game maybe you know, it's 235 or at least that started to cross my mind uh, when we were coming back into the city I got 26k or so I thought like okay might be 235 but I had no idea what the splits uh, should be so I had no idea whether I was gaining on the schedule or that I was losing on the schedule. So I was just running and I don't know, well, we just see where where we end up. Were you getting nervous at all about blowing up or were you like feeling confident that you could hang on for dear life and maintain to some extent the pace? Yeah, I, I don't know, not really. I guess it was just how I felt that this pace was feeling okay. I was, uh, I was feeling relaxed. Like they could, could relax the muscles in, uh, in my cadence. Um, so it was, it was not working at all. I mean, I, of course, I felt that we were running, but um, yeah, I, I noticed that I was sharp enough. I saw everything happening in the group as well. Um, so I just everything was was right. You just felt that and then in the middle of the group I was just cruising along so then it was like yeah okay it's, it turns out today I can handle this speed at least <laughs> and um, yeah then of course when when you're running and you see your splits they're much faster than initially anticipated but then again it's like okay I should probably not really pay attention to the splits now and just run by field and see what uh, that brings me for time wise, and I was, I think, really a good call in this this occasion because at the end, I the group that I was scared to run with initially, or scared, but that I thought like, mm, is this a wise thing to do or not? Uh, I decided to do it anyway, and eventually I ended up uh, leaving the group uh, and just going ahead of them. So, yeah, it was the right call to do, and definitely. What went through your mind when you ended up seeing the finish line, you saw the finish clock, and you saw your watch? What 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 happened at that point? Pure joy, I guess. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's... Um, I mean, of course, I wouldn't have been happy with 2.38 as well, even 2.40 probably, but then when you see... And I, I think it was not necessarily maybe even the time because that's just a number but the feel about how how i accomplished it in the way that it was 
just um, so relaxed until like 37, 30K when, and then you should start to feel your legs and it should start to hurt because otherwise I guess you're not running fast enough. But, uh, and just that even then when it started to hurt and uh, when the legs were cramping up that it's still, I could run a, a decent pace and um, that the energy was still there even after finishing okay the legs were done but the energy level was still there like you know the, the brains were still working <laughs> and i think that was actually the thing that even surprised like the time surprised me maybe but um the way i've done it that made me the most happiest i think it is so well said because it is very uh, uh, like mind-blowing how trashed your legs can feel if you raise raise at a heart rate that's too high or like at a like where your lactate levels build up way too early in a race and you get to those later stages and you're hanging on for dear life start cramping everywhere and at that point when you get to the finish line it's a much different story than when you can run controlled comfortable yet still pushing it but at least having enough energy left in the tank at the end of the race to to finish strong there yeah, that was absolutely very well done over there. So congrats on running such a strong race out there. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's just really this energy management pretty much throughout the whole the whole race. But um, and I think also, uh, as as I mentioned, I didn't have the heart rate monitor on, so I did not watch my heart rate, which could also throw you off the game a little bit if you would have your strap on and you see like, oh, it's maybe a bit high, you start worrying. But if if the legs feel good, the body feels good, then you can uh, stay relaxed into the race. And um, yeah, you probably can race much faster than, than just by watching the watch all the time and you see what heart rate it is. And yeah, you can start worrying for nothing maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I'm glad you actually brought that up because sometimes we do notice indeed athletes, including myself, sometimes get glued to their watch and some of the data, whereas it, it's just one of the elements. At the end of the day, like your feel is so important as well. You can often overwrite some of these things as well. Like, yeah, it might be a signal in certain stages. However, like being able to run comfortable and by feel there's there's an absolute important part there too so yeah and it's also something uh we should keep practicing a little bit as well not just running by heart rate but also sometimes just run by feel yeah. uh, or maybe you can keep your strap on and then just see the data when you get home but uh if you go for a run not looking at the watch and then before you upload everything, anything or before looking at your watch that you see like, okay, this felt like this in this space and heart rate wise, maybe this and that. And then just compare it with what the actual values are yeah. uh, just to get a bit more understanding of uh, how fit you are at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. I recently had a conversation with Dr. Steven Seiler. And one of the topics that he is very excited about is the science and uh, like diving further into the breath work and breathing and how breathing patterns change at different paces and all sorts of different things. And we were talking through that for a bit. As I went out after that on my run too, I was doing some speed work. I was running around whatever, 155 heart rate. And I started just playing around for a little bit of like, all right, yeah, picking up the pace, what is happening with your breathing, slowing down the pace. And I truly paying attention to that, like not just from what is my heart rate doing, but also what is my breathing doing and how does it all sync in with each other and whatnot. And yeah, this is, it's fascinating. Even by um, like listening to your own breathing, you can, you already know like, okay, this is pushing it a little bit and this not and. Like where you can still breathe through your nose is like okay it's easy pace and yeah where you're picking it up and or eventually doing intervals where you sometimes feel getting difficulties breathing it's like okay now i'm pushing it a bit too much now probably tell, tell me more about the nasal breathing because you said in some of your previous marathons you even were breathing part of that through your nose did i hear that correct 
Uh, yeah, I, I, you had that as a topic as well once, I think. Yeah, Patrick, Patrick McCown, we talked about nasal breathing. Indeed. Right. Yeah, I watched that and then I tried it as well, uh, experimented a little bit with it. Um, and right, your recovery runs, your easy runs should be possible breathing through your nose, in my opinion. Uh, that's And not necessarily straight away. Like if you do it for the first time, it might be a bit difficult, but uh, give it a few weeks and try to run your recovery runs with nasal breathing, and then you will find out that eventually it should be possible. Or <laughs> you're running too fast, I guess. <laughs> but no, it, it it should be possible. So I tried it as well, and uh, eventually, uh, I think, yeah, like uh, when I was talking about this half marathon uh, in preparation for the. Uh, Rotterdam Marathon, which never happened in 2020. Um, I noticed that I was still running around 11 or 12K into the race, um, which is breathing through my nose. Mm. And as well, I uh, I started not as fast I, as I could have run because it was just, um, I, I didn't even know how fast I, I could run a half marathon. But anyway, um, so only after like, passing halfway point and I, I picked up the pace more where I had to breathe partially through the mouth as well but um, I think it's uh, it helped you a lot with pacing but also um, yeah as as was said in uh, in your podcast then as well that it helps with uh, saving and uh, what the uh, water eh? you don't have to drink as much as you would need when you're breathing just through your mouth and so a lot of benefits come from it actually yeah yeah oh that's the part that just crosses my mind is when you're talking about oh my half marathon i didn't really know how fast i could run it just just the importance of dreaming big and actually thinking big because even now here right just looking back, some of our messaging where you were saying like, oh yeah, I really, really want to break sub three. Here we are a year and a half later and you ran a 234, right? So I just have to ask you, what's next for you after this? Like, do you, obviously your goals of sub three have been accomplished now. You beat your dad. So what, what what's next after this? Yeah, I guess running retirement then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> throw in the towel yeah. yeah exactly no no i of course now we're already so close to the 230 mark this is and um, the the easy easy next step or not easy but uh easy to make a decision that that's the next step um but yeah there are, there's a lot of uh, pr still to be broken actually yeah? like 5k 10k uh, half marathon as well uh, and usually like i started with this um uh, track season during the summer as well last year which i quite enjoyed like the three thousand meters and five thousand meters uh so i would pick that up in in the summer again uh actually enlisted as well in february for the uh, national championship on the 10k nice uh so uh, just like to run a championship then which uh yeah i think is is really good fun and um, which of course is not really fast but still i should be able to set a pr on the core uh on the 10k since i think my pr at 10k is now 34 or something so it should but, be but, uh, but, but your 5k pr has been like a 15 something right yeah, which is also still not. Uh, it should be faster, I, I would say. Um, this is, I think, fifteen forty-eight. Mm -hmm. uh, but this was like, <laughs> I had like one race left because the marathon was coming up as well. So I had to transition to marathon training more, and I still wanted to do a five thousand meter because first I enlisted for. They were all uh, cancelled because of Corona still. And uh, then I finally got into one, <laughs> I kid you not, like two hours before the race, like someone shot a hole in the, in the cloud, I guess, and uh, it started pouring out and it didn't <laughs> stop. So that canceled the race. Oh, wow. Um, uh, so that one didn't happen. I was basically left with one race, but 
this was um, like the level of participants was not very high. So I had to run the race by myself pretty much. But it was a bit windy as well. And I didn't got the pace right. So I I crossed the 2000 meter mark in six minutes. So that would add up for a 15 minutes 5k. Um, and then I just lost it as well, the pace. So I ended up 15.48. But the 3000 meters, that's, uh, I was quite, quite happy with that. That's 8.40, uh, sorry, 8.55. Nice. So, that's uh, that was a, a nice PR, and, it, uh, and that was in a race as well where everything worked out pretty pretty good. Like someone took the lead, and I could just follow, and then at I think two laps to go or so, uh, two or three guys overtook us, and then it was just everyone by himself. But um, <laughs> you still have like people in front of you that you could try to chase, so that that helped a lot. Um, so yeah, next season try to get some more PRs and yeah, uh, see a, how that will work out. That's a good goal to go after or several different good goals there. So what um, in, in closing here, I just want to ask you, there's, there's a lot of people listening to this um, podcast and to the YouTube video that are looking to improve their running. So just curious, do you have any high level thoughts on what recreational runners can do to improve their running? And to become a stronger, healthier, and happier athlete. I think uh, most important of all is uh, that you make sure you have fun with it. So, um, and there it comes again down to slowing down in the first place. I, I think a lot of people when they go out for runs, they they don't really like it in the beginning because it's just too hard on their bodies, and they make it too hard for themselves. So if you slow down and you make sure you actually are able to look around you, enjoy nature a little bit, um, enjoy the run and not coming home completely wasted, uh, it gives you much more joy of doing it. And as soon as you enjoy what you're doing, you want to do it more. And then you don't have to force yourself to increase your weekly mileage. Uh, It just automatically happens. And with that, your speed comes along as well. So you're going faster and faster and all the benefits come automatically with that. Yeah, very well said. The joy is such an important one to yeah, get out of the door frequently, get out of the door and and yeah, make it a relaxing activity versus like, oh, I have to go on another run again. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I think that was for me the biggest change I, in the beginning. I not necessarily enjoyed running i did it to stay fit and uh, to try to stay healthy but then as long as i slowed down it's like even here in in the area that i'm living i was seeing things on runs that i would never seen before <laughs> while i've been living my whole life here you know? it's just that you have now time to look around you and and enjoy it and uh, especially in in nature but even if you run through a city, it's <laughs> more enjoyable. But if you do it when you can still breathe normally. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a complete different mind shift indeed. And compared to like 10 years ago, even like now wanting to go outside and enjoying a sunrise or a sunset run or like just really almost needing that as part of your day, like versus uh, the other way around of like, oh, need to clock my mileage here. So yeah like even the people around you can say like when you're getting a bit grumpy or stressed and they say like ah, maybe it's time for you to go on a run it's like oh yeah <laughs> right <laughs> and it's that time again so yeah, yeah and it, as soon as you hit that area that you actually need some some running in uh to stay relaxed and i guess you're in good shape as well yeah exactly where, where can people find more about you uh, well, I'm not big on social media, actually, but I do have Strava, uh, which you just pointed out, and uh, everyone can link up uh, with Strava. That's that's no problem. Cool. Sounds good. And then next time you're in LA for a big layover, definitely got to get that run in because there's plenty of great routes to show you over here. So Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it, but as, as with most 
good layovers on good places, they are kept to quite a sh- short time. So sometimes it's difficult. Plus, uh, we have a lot of changes always in the roster. So sometimes, you know, I could see it coming that I would have a layover in LA, but then just the day before it would disappear again. And then uh, you end up being somewhere else uh, in the world. So, but definitely if whatever I land in LA and I know I have at least a day I will uh, send the message. T- totally. Just let me know. I'll drive up. I'll take you to the Santa Monica Mountains or to Mount Baldy or one of the other spots. There's plenty of great, great routes here. So. Sounds perfect. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Danny, thanks so much for sharing all your insights and good luck with all the different PVs ahead. You're welcome. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you for all the information you shared with us. Absolutely. Happy to do so. Thanks, mate. Later. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. I'm blown away how much Danny has improved over time. And it's awesome to hear him talk too, not just about the fast race times, but also about being able to race more controlled and having energy left at the end of a race. I think it also comes to show the importance of the power of the mind and really not holding back and setting big scary goals for ourselves because we can accomplish so much more than we think we can. And so, yeah, I think even in this case, now the 234 is reality for Danny going a step further. And I think even for you listening here, it's like, yes, it's one thing to think about that next step, but maybe already start thinking a few bigger steps ahead. What does that longer time horizon look like? To learn more about the personal best running program with runners of all levels and goals, check out pbprogram.com. And yes, this includes athletes like Danny Huibrechtsen and many other fast men and women, but it also includes those who are looking to finish their first 10K, half marathon or marathon, and those who would like some more guidance and training plans there. Twice a week, we jump on Zoom group coaching calls where anyone from the program can jump on there and ask different questions about their training, their racing, some of the challenges they might experience. That includes myself, some of our PB, other um, coaches, and several different members from the program as well. And also we have a private community, both in Facebook and in Strava, where I'm active in that group daily, as well as many other members in our program and our other PB coaches as well. We talk about upcoming races, we talk about strategies, we talk about troubleshooting questions that come up in the community and that's a great way to all learn from each other that way if you would like to find out more check out pbprogram.com and if you have any questions just shoot me a message and i'm happy to respond there in the next episode of extra miles show number 50 i sit down with dr steven seiler and we talk about running intensity training volume duration breathing patterns and so much more thanks so much for listening and have fun out there on your run later <laughs>